Hi, my name is Jerry Hash. I'm a manual therapist and a physical therapist. I practice part-time in Henderson, Nevada. And this is an absolutely remarkable case. Um, a godsend for the simple fact that I just posted on YouTube less than two days ago, I posted a video describing the lower half of the pelvis and why it's very important to palpate that. This case is coccidynia with lower pelvic fa uh, fixation. And this uh, individual was cutting some plants on a ladder, twisting left and right. And he overdid it. Um, soon after that, he developed severe pain right in the region of the coccyx. He could point right at it. Did a, a, two courses of antibiotics. No change. Was on some mild medications. No change. We're going into the, we're approaching the fourth week of his pain, and his pain is significant. He's had um, some good x-rays done, and we're, we're just not moving anywhere in, in, in his diagnostic process. I screened him. Normal neural tension sites. Normative uh, motion throughout the lower extremities. Normal distal strength. Started to focus in on the back. I was really concerned that maybe there was a, a disc. Could be even a high lumbar disc midline bulge capturing the coccygeal nerves. I mean, that could certainly happen with a rotational injury. I mean, he could even tear a little fragment of the annulus pushing against there. No. I mean, I really thumped on him. I put him in extension and I really, you know, banged on the spinous processes and did the same thing in child's pose yoga position. And I cannot blame his lumbar spine in any way, shape, or form. So then I come and I do a focus eval on the, on the pelvis. And I do all my screening. And I say, you know, look how nicely the left side rotates backwards. Okay, when he's laying on his back. I said, notice the right side is stuck. So I flip him over. I expect to find a right anterior ilium. Okay, start palpating him. And I go, oh my gosh, the ischial tuberosity. And I'm pal palpating the flat portion. Okay, I'm palpating the vertical portion thereof. That is actually anterior. Okay, now that does not correlate with an anterior ilium. With an anterior ilium, you would expect him to be posterior. So at that point I said, aha, we have a combination pattern. We have something else going on. And I said, it's probably an upslip or a downslip. And then I uh, continued the eval, and yes, I could actually push the ilium up a little bit when I was taking up the slack. Could not push up anymore, okay? Tried to push the ilium inferiorly. Um, my contact was right here. I call this the, the uh, posterior iliac shelf. It's a fairly flat portion. Would not go down. Didn't make that little sound, okay? So, I concluded that he had an upslip. Now, started to palpate the ligaments and explained to him how relevant the sacrotubrous, sacrococcygeal, uh, sacrococcygeal, sacrotubris, how they all blend into the, the coccyx and, of course, the sacrum. Sacrospinous coming in transversely. And the right sacrotubrous ligament was very, very taut. Okay? Um, so that was interesting. And truth be told, with an upslip, it should have been slack. So that's a hint that something's not quite right. So, I thought, hey, let's start treatment, okay? And I explained to him, I'm not going to screen your coccyx until I have the pelvis balanced. Balancing your pelvis might eliminate the coccyx pain or make it a lot better. So, let's not even, you know, mess with it and say, oh, it's side bent a little bit to the right of blah, blah, blah. Because of the change in ligaments tone, that would be a reasonable conclusion, it might even be a false, po a false positive because I might really be feeling tense ligament and thinking I'm on bone. It feels very similar when the ligaments are tight. So, we go on, I lie him on his side, I, I bring the ilium back down using my viscoelastic creep model. We spent two minutes doing that. 
And then I went back, got him Lane Supine, and now the spring testing is beautiful, and get him prone, and now the spring test is moving nicely, and, and I can spring him up, and you know, gosh, it's looking good. And then I get him in child's pose yoga position where the body is fully flexed, the hips are bent, knees are bent, blah, blah, blah. All right. Start feeling and springing, and I find out, aha, the sacrum now is torsioned. Okay? It's torsioned to the left about the left oblique axis. In other words, the left lower quadrant was prominent and stuck with spring testing. So I could take up the slack on the right quadrant and the right upper and the left upper quadrant. I could take up the slack with about 20 pounds of force and then I could spring it and it would recoil. Then I would let go and it would, you know, it would spring back just like a shock absorber. On the left side, didn't happen. So we mobilized this one again two minutes with the viscoelastic creep model. Then I said, well, you know, let's test for side bending. I mean, most of the time, 99% of the time, it corrects when you correct the torsion. Check for side bending, it's good. I'm thinking, okay, well, you know, maybe we should now go chase the coccyx. So we lay him down and I start palpating the coccyx and he says, wow, that's starting to feel better. Okay, but there's a tender point down there, right? There's tender, okay? And then I start to feel the ischial tuberosities and I go, oh my God, wow, this is incredible. And what I found, I had to reorient his shorts, you know, because he'd been flipping back and forth on the table. So I line, twisted his shorts and lined them up so the crease in his shorts matched his gluteal crease. Okay? And then when I palpated the medial portion of the ischia, what I found was that on the right side, it was less than an inch close to that crease. On this side, it was two inches lateral to this crease, okay? We're going to treat him now, and I'm going to bring the, the, the left ischium back medially, the right ischium laterally. At that point, based on experience, I fully expect that there will also be a rotational component to this. And so that I'll use hip rotation, internal and external rotation, to, re to reduce that rotational thing. What's absolutely fascinating is the fact that these are profoundly asymmetrical in the lower pelvis, and yet when I do palpation and springing of the upper half of the pelvis, I would tell him, you're fine, you can leave now. But when we come to the lower half, we find this profound asymmetry. How is that possible? Obviously, the lower half, of the lower part of the ischia is farthest from the joint axis. And so therefore they can move a lot and the other landmarks are closest to that joint axis. And therefore they all move fairly symmetrical in three-dimensional space. So, um, we'll lay him down, I'll show you um, the evaluation, we'll stop filming, and then we'll uh, film it again and demonstrate um, luck, our success, if we're able to establish symmetry thereof.